everyone. Hello. My presentation is very much business-like, you know, not exciting and not with social sciences. Uh, right now, I'm actually um, also teaching a class at the undergraduate level, but the presentation is not about that. And funny enough, the class is about sustainability in business practices. Um, so my first day of class was kind of disappointing because not too many students showed up. And I was OK with less students, but this was like two people. And they said, that's what they do. They just don't show up for the first day of classes. So I said, OK. Our students at least show up for the first day, <laughs> if not later. Uh, so any which way, I worked really hard on it because that's not my discipline. I teach finance. And I wanted to teach options and futures contracts and stuff like that. But the dean said, eh, just see if you can do sustainability too. So I had to really design the course. And I'm very happy with what the final outcome is. I've been working since March 15 when Fulbright let me know uh, that I'm coming. Um, but my second uh, purpose is also help Ugede's business school. I'm calling it business. They don't call it business school. Economica and Negocio, which is business, I guess. Um, they attempted to get AACSB accreditation. And I'm not sure if you guys know about what AACSB accreditation is, because the understanding of business schools many times, even from our senior administrative team, is like, you don't do anything, do you? You don't teach students problem solving. What are you talking about? Critical thinking. So I thought I would just mention this is a very really prestigious um, accreditation for any business school to have. So at the end, I have some numbers or somewhere in the middle. Um, so this is uh, an association that has been around since 1960, so more than 100 years. And it's uh, only for business schools, so undergraduate and graduate programs. And uh, it's a non-government organization, so not-for-profit. Uh, their process is very, very rigorous in terms of giving that accreditation to any business school. And uh, that process is run by peer review team of business students. So usually three deans with a chair among the three um, do all the reviews. They are in touch with you prior to their arrival, and they spend like three days on campus. And they can talk to anybody they want to. You cannot say no. They'll say, we want to just talk to junior faculty. And yeah, they will talk to them. Um, and their focus is on four things. You know, teaching, of course, always important, research, curriculum development and uh, learner success. You know, how do we help our students learn? So uh, this is the statistic I was referring to. And there is some, uh, I, I cannot verify that these numbers are exactly right, because various sources give numbers differently. So worldwide, 57 countries, schools from 57 countries have applied. So there are 13,000 business schools. But only 6.7%. Can you read? Is it yeah. Small? Yeah. 6.7% are ACSB accredited, and that's where Ute Day wants to be. They want to add their name, uh, and they failed first time. Um, so that's where I come in, and I'll try to help. Uh, but I'll tell you at the end how my school is so different from their school. Um, and in the US, uh, the rate, I was under the impression it's only 25%. But I kept checking the stats, and I just did the math myself. So the ACSB website says 190. That puts us around 40%, so more than what I thought. Um, so you get, it's not two types, wrong, wrong title, two levels. So when you first go for initial accreditation, you can't just do it overnight. You know, it requires three, five years of preparation, depending <coughs> on where your school is. And Udede found that out pretty quickly, that you really need a lot more preparation. They have been working for a long time, perhaps. And you can be rejected. And we were. When we first went up, we were rejected. They gave us areas to improve. You apply again. I think you have to wait for two years. And then every five years, we have to apply for the accreditation. So we got ours two, two years ago, I think almost three. So we are going up again. We already started preparing for it because they, they have the standards and they keep changing them. Um, they have nine standards, and they do evolve in time. And I'll just give you an old 
change that we experienced and we had to work really hard, which is incorporating ethics through business curriculum. They didn't dictate how you do that. You have to show. And nothing is just word. It has to be documented, assessed, etc. So we created an, um, you know, standalone ethics course. Now we are revisiting it. Do we need it standalone? Or should we go back to incorporating it in the core courses like finance, marketing, etc.? Because finance is so generous. We have so many ethical issues to deal with all the time. So I said, my whole class can be ethics. Uh, and just now, they have added social impact. So how do you benefit the society through what we do? And we are work. I mean, we do a lot already without realizing, uh, but we are working on that. So just for your information, that's my school's mission. Uh, we do have out of 120 credits that the students need for bachelor's degree, 60, 50% have to be liberal arts. Uh, so they have to take not only economics, but writing, communication, uh, any sociology, any lang foreign language if they so desire, politics. So they have a choice. There are some of them mandated, like economics, because they're business students, and some, their choice. They can take whatever they want. Uh, so we really are a very integrated liberal arts business school uh, because our campus has five, uh, four professional schools. We have one of them. Our school of communication is pretty big and high level <coughs> of education. Um, so standard one just says you must have a plan, obviously. And the plan has to be again documented. So who did we consult when we went for our initial accreditation? Stakeholders as most of us understand students, faculty, senior faculty, junior faculty, staff, but we also have our alumni quite important in our school, and we have advisory committees. So we involve them also that are we really teaching what the students need to know because they are running businesses. And of course, you cannot make a plan and go to sleep. You have to continuously change it, and regular monitoring is required. So what we did here is, um, in, in our school, we had a very plain old vanilla MBA program, you know, very generalistic. So we discontinued that and we started a very niche focus program, which is on entertainment and media industry. We are hoping to attract communication students and we have a great music school. So we thought that would be our good audience, so to speak, and business students who want to go into media and entertainment. COVID has really spiked the interest even more in that industry with all the streaming services. And we also started um, analytics program, uh, looking forward to what is needed most. And you probably have heard the target story of how they use their data. Uh, I won't go over my time here. Um, and we also have a big entrepreneurship program. And the students actually compete for dollars uh, to make that idea um, successful. Uh, standard two, no need to explain that the school must have physical and virtual and financial resources. And virtual was forced upon us when COVID hit. Um, so we have now fantastic smart classrooms. Nothing like most schools don't have everything they need, but you know we made tremendous progress. And we have a platinum lead certified school building uh, where most. Actually, I would say most of our business classes are taught in the building. So many times I'll go to my office when I'm teaching, I'll not leave the building. When I go down, teach a class, go back up to my office, I have no idea what's happening outside. So at the end of the day, I'll ask the student, cold outside or not? <laughs> Let me know. So we have an excellent sustainable building, and that's why the dean asked me to teach a sustainable class. Um, it's Examples of financial resources are plenty. Uh, when I was the interim dean, I was working with an um, uh, alumni who was willing to give us $700,000 to have a summer entrepreneurship program. He called it 12-month program, but it happened right at the COVID time. I wasn't successful. That would have been nice to say I did get I did. Um, that's all right. Um, standard three is the most important one, and that's where the dean wants my input. Um, so the numbers must be sufficient, of course. You know, students shouldn't have to wait in line if they want to check if they're graduating on time. We should make help available to them. And most important is faculty. Antonio, you were talking about PhD holding faculty. So 
ACSB has four categories, scholarly academic, professional academic, scholarly practitioner, and instructor pra practitioner. So they have percentages. So SA minimum is 40%. And I think that's where Ude Day may have a slight problem. They have a lot of part-time faculty right. uh, who have industry experience, but not uh, necessarily PhDs. Uh, and the total of the four categories must be at least 90%. And the A, I haven't figured out what A stands for. I should read carefully. It used to be O, which I remember, Adda. So person who has a PhD but doesn't do any research goes there, and they are restricted from teaching advanced classes. They can only teach 100 level first year classes uh, if they don't have the proper qualification. Our professional staff is just fantastic. So we have uh, student help. We have career development. We have professions program. We have actually a dedicated uh, business librarian, uh, and he worked on Wall Street, so he's just amazing uh, at the speed at which he delivers our question, answers to our question. Uh, so I think we are pretty good. Now we have to see what happened with COVID, and our institute college was really affected financially, uh, COVID times, despite some government help. Um, so standard four is curriculum. Um, you have to be forward thinking. You have to make it relevant. Uh, like we used to have a human resource management. Actually, we used to call it personnel management a long time ago. Uh, there was not a whole lot of interest by the students. The jobs were not there. So we don't have it. But finance, uh, highest, most popular concentration in my school, uh, we created more tracks in them so to guide the students to be professional. So you want to be a wealth manager, you have a track. You want to work on Wall Street, we have a track. And you want something in between, like you work for major corporations in their treasury department, we have a track for that. So this was providing a lot, lot more professional guidance. And those, one of the tracks is funded by an alum. Um, we have about a million dollars he gave. That's not a lot of money, but we are not Harvard. Um, so that's the money that students manage, actually, with no faculty supervision. That was the condition, that students buy and sell stock on their own. So we are very proud of that. Um, and um, do you have a systematic review process? So Alka wants to teach a new class, she can go for it. Or is there some kind of a review of what she wants to teach, how she wants to teach? And we have three or four levels of approvals that any course, if it's going to be taught permanently, and more importantly, if it's required, then there is more screening of that. So we never have uh, any problem. And assessment, like I said, you know, it's not enough to re make business finance a required class. What are the students learning in it? That's where I'm also going to help Uday Day, is how do they assess? Because if there are so many part-time people, how do you ensure consistency? Um, assurance of learning. So there could be direct measures, like I could give an exam, a quiz, write a paper, make presentations. That could be direct measure of what students are learning. But they also ask you to do indirect measures. So we send a survey out to employers who are hiring our students. You know, how are they prepared? Are they ready? We send exit survey, which is the success is a little bit iffy because the student has graduated. They don't care. <laughs> you know, whatever they write. And then, of course, we write to our uh, advisory council. They are really involved uh, directly. For example, we just ask them to assess our students' writing. We used to do that ourselves. And I said, why not ask the business people to do it? So that was our first attempt. Um, I'll, Mason, let me know if I'm running over time, please. Okay. Can I take a photograph? <laughs> sure. In live action? <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> I, I just thought you're blocking something nope. and I'm there. OK. So learn and progression. Uh, Antonio talked about, what did you say, Antonio? 30% of the students graduate or something like that here if they go to university? Yeah, more so, than 25, 30%, yeah. yeah. So do we have clear, consistent, and efficient policies? Or do we admit anybody who applies? Transfer students, do you have a policy? Career development, do you have a policy? And progress towards graduation. So we, we do a very good job with that, you know, mandatory meetings for students to make sure that they are on the right path. Because our requirements are quite, quite complicated, so sometimes students do get confused. Um, so teaching effectiveness, we are a teaching school. Uh, research is required, but teaching effectiveness is the main focus of our school, small classes, 
my class never has more than 25 because I demand too much, but 35 is the size, 25 to 35. By the way, I forgot to tell you, I teach at Ithaca College, which is a private um, college in upstate New York, Ithaca. We are Cornell University's neighbors. They are on the other hill. We look at them, they look at us, mm -hmm. uh, and much smaller. Cornell has 20,000 plus, we have 5,000 plus students. But we do have graduate program, and very well-known programs throughout the country, uh, whether it's communication or health sciences, et cetera. Um, so what do we do to measure if effectiveness? Every class, every section, the students get a chance to review the teaching of the faculty. Every class, mandatory. Uh, and if somebody forgets, they pay a price when they come up for tenure. <laughs> so students have a lot of opportunities to write qualitative feedback as well as quantitative feedback, and no exceptions. You could be teaching for 40 years, like I have been, but every section I teach must conduct this now online assessment. Uh, we also do, like, we come up for tenure after five years. In every school, you have a process, I'm sure. So we have a second year review, fourth year review, then the tenure review. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Mason is giving me a signal here. Uh, <laughs> impact of scholarship. Are you writing papers for Journal of Finance we don't, that nobody reads? Are, are you really writing papers that practitioners can actually <coughs> implement? Um, and I have done basically multidiscipline, overlapping dis discipline, and sometimes that's friendship-based, but that's also interest-based. So I'm very proud to say that two lawyers with me, we wrote papers on Airbnb and Uber when the names were not known at all. And many of the things we were wondering about, worried about, have come true, and the companies have addressed those issues uh, with Airbnb discrimination issue because they used to require a picture. Now they don't release the picture until you're approved, things like that. So those were very good uh, papers, I felt. And that's what I like to do, interdisciplinary stuff. So right now I'm working on green bonds, uh, which is how companies raise money for climate change activities. Um, the new standard is, this is the one, social impact. And that can be done internally or externally. And I'll just give you one example in the interest of time. Um, we have a program funded initially by the US government called WITA. So it's Voluntary Income Tax Assistance Program. Anybody who has lower income can get a free tax return, fine. And our students used to fly to Alaska and help the fishermen there because they were entitled to some federal government money that they didn't know about. So our students would fly with the professor. So we do a lot of that. We help international students file their tax returns, visiting faculty file their tax returns. So I think that creates a tremendous social impact in our opinion. Um, and so I can't help this university in the long run because they have to do something over time to increase the qualification of their faculty. Short run, I'll do two things. Uh, explain the assurance of learning assessment and um, funding I cannot do <laughs> to find the money themselves. So this is just a quick thing I was able to put together. Uh, it's like a college, it's a very small college as you can see. Uh, compared to Udete. Uh, I mean, they have 2,400 undergraduate students. I don't feel that way in the school that they have that many students, but they claim they do, officially. <laughs> <laughs> and graduate program is just 2458 compared to our little 30. We are a very tiny school. And that worries me. You know, would I be able to help such a big school with whatever advice I can give? Uh, the tuition is comparable, but actually we are cheaper because that 48,000 is not what people pay. That 48 is published, but there's tremendous discount as in every university. Uh, so we are actually cheaper than Ude Day, but we do have room and board because 95% of our students live on campus. Uh, so we have been accredited for a long time. I hope I can help them a little bit, uh, if not completely, but that would be a good accomplishment. Any quick questions? Yeah, I got a question. Is is the first?